Can you give me the phone number? Uh, I don't have that. You'll see a whole list of numbers with the Zoom announcement. There's a whole list of phone numbers as well. Okay. And I have to go out of the Zoom program to get that. Okay. I'll try to call back in. On video with the Zoom, but just fire up your telephone separately and use them both. Let me see if I can do that. I'll be back. You can put, put a phone number in the chat for him. Okay. Yeah, uh, if you can put it in chat. Did somebody put it in chat? Yes. Dr. Thomas is going to do that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Okay. Dr. Devon, uh, cardiologist from Philadelphia. We wanted you to speak on cardiovascular concerns while Dr. Williams is getting ready to come back with vaccine. Thanks, Dr. Maxey, and thanks for asking me to participate in this, which I think is a very important discussion. As you said, I'm a cardiologist. I work in Philadelphia. And if we just move back to the fall of 2019, at that time, we knew nothing about coronavirus, but we did know about influenza. And we were used to having patients who come with influenza having cardiac complications like heart attacks and heart failure, et cetera. So in the early part of this year, when the news about coronavirus came out, I thought, well, we got this, we've dealt with this before, this shouldn't be a problem, until my patients, my colleagues started to drop dead. I said, this is a little bit different. Um, as we know, this virus is about 10 to 20 times more virulent than the flu bug. Uh, and in terms of heart disease, it does things very similar to what we saw with influenza. For example, if you are a heart patient or if you have coronary disease, if the arteries that supply blood to your heart muscle are clogged to an extent. You may be fairly asymptomatic, but if you're admitted to the hospital with a viral pneumonia, and now your oxygen counts drop, your blood pressure drops, your blood pressure goes up, that stress could provoke a myocardial infarction. And so that's a lot of what we've seen with this virus. But in addition to that, it's not only the classic kind of heart attacks. I think Dr. Hawkins spoke about this earlier, that one of the problems with this virus it increases our coagulability, the ability of our blood to clot. So in addition to having the classic heart attack, we've had patients who had acute coronary thrombosis, clogging the arteries due to a massive blood clot. Now this is interesting because sometimes we see it in the patient who's in the ICU sick with coronavirus. Sometimes we see it as a primary event. In the newspaper, they're talking about us approaching 100,000 deaths but a lot of folks have said that number may be lower than we thought because a lot of people are dying at home and haven't been labeled as having coronavirus. And in fact, we've seen it in younger people, 30 year olds and 40 year olds who all of a sudden, have sudden cardiac death uh, due to this acute coronary thrombosis. But in addition to that, um, one of the things that the coronavirus does because the inflammation of the heart muscle can cause the heart muscle to fail called myocarditis. Now, one of the reasons this is very difficult to manage is because a myocarditis often looks clinically like a heart attack. That is, patients have abnormal EKGs, they have abnormal blood tests, and so the cardiologist is trying to decide which way we should go in managing the patient. Again, remember, these are very sick people. We really don't want to expose our echo technician. We don't really want to expose our nurses and doctors with the cath lab unnecessarily to a patient that we can't help. So we have to kind of make a decision whether this is a patient who has myocarditis and hopefully will get better from that, or this is a patient that we need to be aggressive about taking to the cath lab and maybe opening an artery or two. They also suffer from arrhythmia, irregular heartbeats. Now heart patients in general can have some irregular heartbeats, particularly if you're taking medications that will alter your electrolytes and cause your heartbeats to be irregular. And that's interesting because of the whole discussion about hydrocortisone, uh, chloroquine and chloroquine. Um, the president's taking it, but we really don't have any studies that say that this is a good drug that's gonna be very efficacious. In addition to this, those drugs can also cause arrhythmia because they can change the electrical activity in the heart. So if you have a patient who has COVID, you know, maybe this is not a good choice. The drug has been fairly safe for patients who have arthritis, malaria, but again, in the sick patient with uh, coronavirus, I don't think this is something that we should really consider. 
And then for the very, very sick patient, what do we do for the guy who's in the ICU and we can't ventilate him and we can't bring the oxygen account up? One of the modalities that is available, but in a limited amount is ECMO. That's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. What we do is we put in catheters, take blood from the patient, we run it through a machine, we replace the oxygen, take out the carbon dioxide and return it to the patient. Now, what we're trying to do is rest the patient until that point when they can recover. Hopefully they can recover from the virus on their own. And if that's the case, this could be a life-saving modality. Again, has not been definitively proved to be effective. Uh, some discussion in, in the uh, news has been about blood pressure medication. We know that coronavirus affects the ACE2 receptor. Those receptors are found in the lungs, the heart, and the blood vessels. But a lot of the medications that you take, the lisinopril, the divan, the valsartan, also affect the ACE2 receptors. So some people have postulated that maybe we shouldn't take these medications because maybe it makes the situation work worse. And again, data to this point has not been shown definitively that the patient should be stopped from these medications. Also, these patients, these medications are very helpful for patients who have heart conditions like heart failure and hypertension. So you really need to consult your cardiologist or your physician before stopping your ACE inhibitors. And the last thing I want to say is that you know, with this coronavirus, a lot of people have been afraid to go to the doctors, afraid to go to the hospitals. And the other thing we've seen is that people without coronavirus, coronavirus are starting to suffer from their disease, from their coronary artery disease, from their heart failure, from the hypertension complications, just because they're not getting appropriate care. So even though there is a risk for going to see your doctor, or even though there's a risk for going to the hospital, you have to lose your judgment. If you think you need to go, you need to go because otherwise you might succumb to the disease that you had prior to this uh, disease. I'll stop here and be ready to take questions later. Thank you very much, Dr. Vaughn. I'm sure we have a lot of comments and questions. Uh, Dr. Richard Williams, uh, who is my mentor. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Can you? Very well. Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Very well. We Will somebody hear. tell me if you can hear me? You, loud and clear, my friend. You're coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I couldn't hook up the phone thing. I don't know what's wrong with those numbers, but anyway, I tried it three times. So we'll try it with the computer. I'm going to talk a little bit about vaccines, and I mean just a very, very as I started to say before, this is a very fluid area, and that is because of the fact that no uh, definitive vaccine has yet to, been developed that is, uh, has been determined to be entirely effective. I'm just going to mention some of the work that's being done on several fronts. And there's some background noise. I'd appreciate it if people could mute. So suffering enough challenges. Please mute. Please mute. Thank you. OK, uh, the, I think the, uh, the most inspirational study that is being done now is not in the United States, it's in England. And um, as you know, the vaccine is being developed, vaccines are being developed to try to boost the immune system in fighting uh, viral diseases such as this. Uh, at the University of Oxford, a clinical trial, which is uh, still recruiting uh, participants, started uh, back in late April. And to cut to the chase on this trial, it's a, uh, a study in, uh, that uh, began with uh, six monkeys, uh, six uh, rhesus macaque monkeys. And uh, to make a long story short, the vaccine proved to be uh, entirely effective in all of those cases, all of those monkeys. So then they moved on to human studies. And uh, after recruiting a number of initial uh, uh, participants in phase one, they uh, found that um, there was an 80% uh, chance for success uh, based on initial results. Uh, this has been very, very much hyped uh, in the media and otherwise, and the US government has picked it up and has poured a billion dollars into their research efforts in England. I might say that this particular vaccine is interesting because of the fact that uh, it has a different mechanism of operation than all of the other vaccines that are being developed in 
including the one at NIH uh, under Dr. Fauci and, and company. Uh, this is a vaccine that uh, uh, is developed uh, by uh, cleaning out uh, the uh, retrovirus from an adenovirus, which is a cold virus, and injecting uh, COVID-19 into that space. COVID-19, as you know, is a retrovirus. And uh, what that does basically is to, to develop a, uh, a virus which is uh, changed, but it's still COVID-19. So the, uh, the idea is to give people a little bit of, of, uh, of COVID-19 in an attempt to boost their immune system and uh, uh, make them, render them uh, immune to uh, COVID-19 full infection. That's a controversial concept, obviously. But I might remind people that that's exactly the same way that some vaccines have worked in the past, including polio vaccine uh, back in the days of Salk and Sabin. Um, and uh, so that's the most exciting one on the scene. There's, there are others. There's uh, one company called Moderna, which is uh, uh, testing its uh, mRNA vaccine in uh, Seattle. And uh, they've uh, announced that they've produced antibodies in all uh, 45 trial participants up to this point. These are healthy vo volunteers aged 18 to 55. And they, they get two shots per day uh, for uh, 20, uh, that are 28 days apart. In any event, uh, there is a great deal of uh, positive expectations from uh, this particular vaccine as well. And uh, they're uh, moving right on. Uh, they've received permission from the FDA to start a phase two study of the vaccine and expects to start phase three in July. So it's on the fast track uh, regulatory review if it succeeds in a, a phase three clinical trial, meaning that uh, if it does succeed in phase three, it will very quickly be put on the market uh, by the FDA. Uh, so that's a U.S. drug, uh, which is uh, being done in conjunction with a commercial company called Moderna. There are several other trials that are going on. There's an Inovio trial. Uh, there's a trial of vaccines in Australia and a number of pharmaceutical companies, including Johnson & Johnson and Sanofi are working on uh, uh, vaccines. Pfizer has... Uh, teamed up with a German company to develop one. And the company, the uh, vaccine that's being developed in England at Oxford is actually being uh, uh, sponsored by AstraZeneca. Uh, so uh, pharmaceutical companies are very, very much involved in this. And go back to what I said before, and that is that this is a fluid area of investigation. No uh, certified vaccine has been developed yet. There are hopes with the Oxford vaccine that it may be available as early as September, uh, which would really be something else. All of the other vaccines are touted uh, to possibly be ready by the end of the year or at best uh, the first part of next year. So that's the, the one that's the, the hottest one on the, uh, on the front burner so far. I'll stop there, see if there are any questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Williams, uh, this, this is Dr. Shabrat. I hope you're able to hear me. Hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I finished my presentation. Can you hear me? This is Dr. Jesse, Shabrat. did you have a comment? Or? I would like to do a rapid questionnaire around the speakers. Let me just put some questions out there and you can jump in and answer them. From my area of specialty, I'm very concerned about the majority of my patients have some form of, of hypertension. Now, I don't know who knows the most about hypertension, uh, Dr. Norris or me, and the cardiologist, Dr. Javon, and Dr. Williams, but there are some concerns about the ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blocking agents, and whether or not we should take those medicines. There have been some articles in New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet. So I'm going to ask uh, 
you three gentlemen to give me a rapid fire question to that. Then we're going to jump to Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Surratt and respirators and the areas that they talked about. Uh, so you can give some quick insights into those from the cardiologist. Somebody said that they took the very smartest cardi cardiologist and turned them into kidney specialists. I don't know. Uh, that's only because of the fact that uh, nephrologists think that they're the heart of the matter, <laughs> which they aren't. <laughs> Sorry, Keith. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, I'll take the uh, the first bite and so forth. Can you hear me, Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, Richard, I'll take the first bite uh, or swipe, I guess you might say, about the ACE inhibitor uh, situation. You and I talked before, and I think I gave a little presentation at one point about uh, the ACE2 gene uh, re receptors and uh, the uh, impact uh, that uh, the importance that that might have in regards to this COVID-19 uh, situation. I don't want to go all the way through that again. I'll simply uh, say that uh, the article that you referred to in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think was a definitive article that uh, showed that uh, there is no reason to think that uh, stopping ACE inhibitors or herbs in uh, patients uh, who have hypertension is going to be beneficial. In fact, it was it suggested that there may be a benefit in uh, in continuing that the the ARBs and ACEs may be a benefit uh, in regards to the COVID virus uh, situation because of the way that it operates at the membrane. So I'll stop there and see if anybody else has any suggestions about that. I think I agree with you. That's the, the literature is a little controversial. It seems there's just as much evidence that it's harmful as it's helpful. So right now we really don't have a decision on that. So the decision has been to continue the ACE inhibitors unless there's a compelling reason to stop them. Yeah. Dr. Keith Norris still on? Agree. Yeah, and I agree. I, I think the the propensity of the literature is um, continue the continued uh, therapy, ACE and ARP therapy, and um, and make sure uh, patients' blood pressures are well controlled. And um, at, at least at this point, the, the data does not suggest, at least uh, the propensity of data does not suggest that there's any disadvantage to not continuing. Now, Dr. Sherrod and Dr. Hawkins, is this a lung disease, an infectious disease, or both? And we both, you both talked about prevention. And I know there's been some controversy in New York about the use of intubation, that it may be more deadly. Uh, what do we think about those? And I'd like you both to comment on that. And then further, doctor, um, we all have children and we're all concerned about their welfare and safety. So rapid fire on that, Dr. Hawkins. I think that uh, the ventilators are, it's a big step when you uh, intubate someone, there's a risk that there'll be a complication of intubation. But most of the time when people are being intubated, they're being intubated because they, you can't get their oxygen level high enough. However, there have been some, I believe some adverse consequences to this intubation on both sides of the equation. Some individuals, hospitals are making the decision not to intubate people because particularly in the past few months when there was not enough PPE available. And they said, well, we only have X number of ventilators and therefore Mrs. Jones really is not gonna survive and doctor's best guess. And therefore we're not gonna, this is me using the word, it may not be, it may not have been said by anybody, waste the ventilator on her or him. Uh, and then the other thing is that some people were intubated prematurely be, because the feeling was that, well, once they crash, we're not gonna get them back. And Pre-COVID, we've made these decisions all along about the fact that the person needs to be intubated before they crash, because once they crash, they're not going to survive CPR. And so it's complicated. It's not black and white. There's an awful lot of grayness out there. I mentioned particularly about the idea about um, uh, removing the circuits so that uh, we're not having problems with uh, um, COVID-19 being spread throughout the units to the next patient on the next ventilator. Um, uh, ventilators are a tool we have to use, 
and uh, physicians and other practitioners used to use them responsibly. And, and just to chime in on that, this is Dr. Sherrod, um, and I need to ask a question to Dr. Hawkins too, because as we evolve in the, in the treatment of this infection, and it is an infectious disease, but it actually uh, affects almost every organ system in the body, uh, and it creates uh, what we call an inflammatory illness in children. Um, I was listening to a report from Houston uh, and these physicians, it was a special report on Saturday, I believe. They have been uh, using the respirator as little as possible and using high flow oxygen. And based on the presentation from the physicians in that facility, and I don't remember the name of the facility in Houston, they have been getting uh, very good results in keeping people off the ventilator using the high flow um, situation, um, high flow oxygen uh, situation, they were saying that their mortality, they were seeing actually less mortality since they had switched over to this method. And then I know in New York, they began to think that maybe the ventilator may be doing more harm than good because of the uh, high pressure, peak pressure and all of that. And so I'd like you to uh, kind of comment on that. I know that they began to place patients uh, face down to improve their ability to uh, breathe and try to actually keep them off the ventilator because there is some question about whether the ventilator was actually contributing more to the mortality uh, than, and I know it's a risk benefit uh, ratio, but if you could talk a little bit about that, that I think that would be helpful. Um, so I'm gonna say from the outset that I don't have an answer. Um, because I think these things are individually cases. Uh, COVID-19 is an infectious disease, but uh, as you indicated, uh, there are inflammatory responses that happen. There are also uh, at the spectrum, the far end of the spectrum, adult respiratory distress syndrome, where you have leaky capillaries and all this other stuff that, that's a complication of not just COVID, but any acute lung injury that's severe enough. Um, the Many of the uh, bus have to use a sort of a, a pressure limited ventilation where we have to, mo have to modify how we deliver oxygen and expand the lung and it's based on a pressure rather than a volume because risk of barotrauma, uh, pneumothorax and the complications thereof. And so prone ventilation is one of the ways we can also reduce the amount of pressure and oxygen we have to use. So there are all kinds of techniques that um, the, the intensivists have to use to try to mitigate lung injury from the ventilator itself. And again, intubation is not without risk. Um, I don't know if I've answered all the question. I, I, you know, I, I'm reluctant to say yes, uh, black and white, because I'm, uh, there's a lot of grayness there. And I don't know if those physicians have compared how they did universally versus, you know, and every patient's different, as you know. Exactly. So exactly. I'm, I'm reluctant to say, but I, I hope that what I'm pleased to hear is that they're having success with presumably reducing the amount of oxygen that people had to be on and they're saving lives. I think that's the bottom line of it. We used to think the oxygen is very, very toxic. Oxygen is not as toxic as we used to think. People can be on high flow oxygen for long periods of time and not suffer the consequences of high oxygen. Right. This is an ongoing evolving situation and we are all learning and that's why we're, I, I was bringing up those uh, new things because we are learning new things as we treat this illness. There was one question to me on the stat, on the chat uh, from Cynthia. I believe she wanted to know the number three factor. The three factors is one, the first one is the status of the uh, immune system of the host. And the second one is the amount of exposure, the viral load that you get from, uh, you, you acquire from your exposure. Uh, your contact with a person, your contact with the surface or putting your hands in your face. The amount of virus that you actually expose your body to is the second factor. And the third factor is the virulence of the organism. How bad is this virus? And we know that it's worse than influenza because of the, uh, the uh, diffuse inflammatory response that it causes in the body. And that's what we're seeing primarily in kids is the inflammatory illness when they have no other symptoms, they can come in with this toxic shock-like uh, syndrome and it's inflammation. It's the body really responds 
It's a hyper response of the body in fighting the infection. That's what creates the cyto cytokine storm. I have a question of all the speakers. I want to introduce this by speaking to Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas has reviewed a number of studies and I'd like him to, to speak on it briefly, but I've had a lot of pushback from people that is this virus real? Is it a hoax? Are African-Americans and other minorities really more susceptible? And Dr. Thomas, if you speak on that a second, then I'd like each of the speakers to tell us, is this a real risk for our people? Is it a risk for us opening up and doing the jobs that require us to have direct contact? What about church? What about schools? Again, rapid response with Dr. Thomas, the articles that you have been kind enough to run past me and to me. Just very briefly, uh, it is real. It is not a hoax. It was not made in a laboratory. This is nature's way of telling us something's wrong. And what's wrong is a society that treats us differently in the context of our health. If our people buy into this hoax, we will be destroying ourselves. In the past, we looked to the CDC, whether it was a David Satcher or who else was there to protect us. We looked to HHS, whether it was Lou Sullivan. We looked to the government to protect us. This is the first time the government in my lifetime has abandoned us. We truly feel on our own. And to have the largest microphone in the world send disinformation, confusion, that's what's so frightening people. So we're on our own here and our communities need to have all this stuff translated so they understand their risk. We have images right now of black churches, choirs, singing, no mass, nothing. We have people out having parties. We have people interpreting social distance as, I'm gonna stay away from Dr. Maxie because I don't know him, but Pookie's coming over for the barbecue because Big Mom is cooking. I'm just putting it straight like it is, okay? I'm getting my information from the black barbers at the front line. They feel like they're fodder. They're being pushed out there, making a decision between putting food on the table or putting their life at risk. We and just need to make sure that as this data comes out with more evidence, how it's impacting us, that it doesn't become a black disease or a Hispanic disease or immigrant disease. We need to keep that theme of we're all in this together because we truly are. I thought you were going to say if Thank my you. <laughs> who are who shall repent and change their ways, I will heal the nation. But uh, ladies and gentlemen on the panel, uh, first of all, I appreciate you, but let's take a last round to address is this real? Is it a hoax? What should we do? And then let's open the questions and discussion. Dr. Randy, briefly, is it definitely real? I'm sorry, it's definitely real. One of the questions that I just to highlight, and I appreciate uh, Thomas mentioning that, this idea of why Black folks are getting more of the disease. And I think that we know about our risk factors, but we need to remember about poverty and folks who can't stop working, who are getting a larger inoculum that, uh, that uh, Dr. Schrott has spoken of. There are all these different things, and, and we need to be careful that we don't let folks, I agree with that, call it a Black disease and shoot things on the rug and and not uh, have insurance, which our prior president want to make sure everybody had, et cetera, and I'm gonna stop there. Yeah, and I think uh, our younger people, uh, and I've heard this from my nephews and nieces, and they're, they're thinking one, they don't trust the system. They, they think that they are actually giving you the virus when they do the nasopharyngeal swab. And I was listening to a podcast and this rapper was talking about how they were violating our rights by safer at home and it was really kind of interesting because this minister came on and he said, you know what, son? He said, I'd rather be in my house than to be in my grave. Everything is relative. But our, I, I think we have to, and you know, it is very frightening because I text my friend at the CDC and you know, I had ultimate respect for the Center for Disease Control. And I asked Walter, I said, where are you guys? This is your game, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. That's what you do, epidemics. Where are they? They have been muted. And we got this person up there like 
Dr. Thomas said, giving all of this false confusing information on a daily basis. And it's very, very frightening. We have no coordinated national plan. Luckily, we have a governor in the state of California who has actually created a very excellent plan that should be modeled at the national level. But this is very, very frightening. Very frightening. Dr. Norris? Yes, I'll just say two things quickly. One, uh, working with a group in, in the Bronx, and we've looked at data by race, ethnicity in the Bronx. And so, um, the, you know, there's more deaths for Blacks and Hispanics. But once you're hospitalized, the risk of death is the same across racial ethnic groups. So uh, getting to what um, Randy and others have said, so the, the risk is occurring out, it's what occurs outside the hospital, which is you know, related a lot to uh, jobs and um, uh, density of housing and, and, and the social risk factors, right? But once you're in, you know, but so those who make it to the hospital, there's actually no difference in mortality rate. So there's no innate inherent susceptibility per se. That's one. The second, is it real? <clears throat> it's interesting. So we sort of compare everything to the Spanish flu, 1918, where there were apparent estimated 200,000 Americans die. We are getting close to that number now, but we're probably almost there. If, if you really want to compare in 1918, they didn't have ventilators. Normal. They didn't have antibiotics with secondary yeah, pneumonia. He's a doctor. So with all the things we have now, if we didn't have that, yeah, we'd be go in and tell close to where they are, close to where we were in deaths in 1918, and we haven't hit our second wave yet. So this is really very, very real. Dr. Devon? Okay. Well, yeah, I think believe it's real because of my personal experience, which I sort of addressed earlier. You walk in the hospital, sort of like a dystopian movie. You go there and there's nobody in the hallways because we have no visitors. Then every other room has one of those uh, PPE carts with the gloves and gowns, et cetera. And then, you know, what, what humbles me is that people I know, people I work with, people you, you don't know the health history, but presume to be healthy, end up in the hospital on the ventilator for weeks and then die. Uh, I don't know what's fake about that. I mean, there's nobody in the hospital who would, you know, do this to our colleagues unless it were true. So yes, it is true. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to just- Wait, before you go, I'd like to make a comment. Who's that? Dr. Williams. Go Dr. Ahead. Williams. Oh, okay. I was looking for you. I didn't see you, Dr. Williams. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, In any way, a comment on someone else's comment, and that was something that uh, Dr. Randy Hawkins mentioned in regards to ventilators. I want to pose the question about whether there isn't a better system and uh, which is more efficient and less problematic uh, than uh, vent using ventilators, and that's using a, what's called ECMO. Is Dr. Hawkins still on? Randy, are you still there? Yes, well, he this is. is. Randy, okay. can you... this is a membrane oxygenator, which can be used. Still, still there, and okay. I'm not sure. I'm not, um, sure could, I'm not sure if everybody has access to ECMO. Certainly, the uh, that's that's the, my the, that's my pressure point, pressure Randy. Pressure that everybody pressure. doesn't have everybody doesn't have access to it, but uh, it's a matter of who is given access to it. Because my understanding is that ECMO is much more efficient than ventilators and much less dangerous. Uh, however, they're all, and uh, unless an individual is hospitalized in a, a facility that has, uh, has ECMO, uh, the membrane oxygenator, uh, he or she is not going to. Uh, uh, be able to avail themselves of that resource. So I'd just like to, before I make my comments about whether this is real or not, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that, about ECMO. Well, the uh, we don't have ECMO in our community hospitals uh, where excellent care is provided, but they're available at all the tertiary hospitals. 
So uh, I'm not sure that it's something that would be available to the average person. You remember yeah. that, uh, three, um, and Jerry mentioned ECMO earlier, so maybe he has some experience with it or maybe his community hospital has it. But you know, remember when there were like, all the, the hospitals, our hospitals were full of patients. And, and so I don't know how you would decide who would get that ECMO because it's actually a bit complicated. You know, you got all these lines in and out and it's not, it's not easy science. No, I think it's a, really about the limit of a resource. In fact, I think if you're over 60 years old, you won't get ECMO. It's only gonna be given to younger patients. And then, you know, somebody has to decide who's gonna get the ECMO. And I haven't seen the racial breakdown. It would be interesting to see that. Yes. I suspect that we may find that we're not getting it as other folks are. That's my whole point. Okay, I just wanted to go on uh, with my comments about whether this is real or not. It is real. I think people like Jerry Devon can document that, as he had mentioned. Uh, there's no hoax about coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. COVID it's killing people. I think uh, anybody who says it isn't and it isn't real is flying in the face of actual fact. And that's an anti-intellectual argument. I don't think we want to even deal with that. Uh, however, it uh, the word is out in certain communities that it is not real, that this is a hoax. And I think we have to do everything that we can through uh, situations like what we're in right now to dissuade people from that kind of thinking. Uh, I uh, would like very seriously to say that uh, with all due respect to programs like this and to uh, discussing the pros and cons of this or that regarding, we have to get out on the front lines and get the message out. Uh, webinars do a, a certain amount of that, but there are other ways that we need to get out there and make sure that folks in the community are getting the correct message. I just finished writing a grant proposal uh, to Pharma uh, for a grant which uh, does exactly that. It establishes what I call the heart, mind, and spirit project, which is a uh, essentially a, a modified health, health fair type thing, which attracts hundreds of individuals in a community. And in this case, it's going to be South LA, Randy. Um, and uh, it's being done in conjunction with Fame Church. So the idea is to try to use uh, this mechanism to get the word out and even do uh, some diagnostic uh, testing and some serological testing in that format. That way you're translating what you, you're talking about uh, here in these kinds of pro programs into actual action that can affect individuals. So I would uh, certainly uh, ask everybody to consider getting involved with something like that. Just, just, can I ask uh, uh, Dr. Williams a question? <laughs> yes. You, you can say no, Randall. Randall, can I ask Richard a question? Go ahead. Can yeah, so yeah, Richard, and I guess anyone, but Richard, are there uh, dangerous shortcuts that are being made regarding this vaccine development? When I heard and, and read the experts that do a vaccine development, they all talk about a year to 18 months. And they talk about how difficult it was to develop RNA yeah. virus vaccines. And I'm just really wondering about whether we're rushing this thing yes. so much that we're going to have really significant adverse consequences to this vaccine thing. Excellent point. Excellent point. Uh, and that's something that we won't know until we get there. Uh, and that's unfortunate because there are going to be a lot of people who may be placed at risk uh, in using a vaccine which may not turn out not to be what we expect efficiency wise or may be dangerous uh, safety wise. Again, I'd like to get I'd comment on that. And um, uh, the, the thing is that we can only go on precedent. Uh, and uh, the best precedent that we can use is Ebola back in 2014 uh, when uh, Liberia uh, was uh, beset by Ebola in particular. Not gonna give a long history on that, but 
uh, as you know, there was a desperate search for or a development of the vaccine and it succeeded. Uh, but uh, before uh, the vaccine could be used on any widespread basis, uh, Ebola was essentially con uh, was conquered by the use of uh, uh, social distancing techniques and uh, contact tracing, et cetera. So you need to look at the history of what happened with Ebola in regards to uh, whether uh, vaccines may or not be uh, safe to use, et cetera. By the way, the vaccine that was developed for Ebola is now one of the ones that's being targeted or used uh, uh, to further development for COVID-19. Uh, so anyway, we won't know until we get there, Jerry. Uh, we can only speculate, and with all this rush, you, know, you have to recognize that you got to do things a little bit different when you're in the heat of a crisis, as opposed to looking ahead and trying to strategize a plan, as, Dr., as President Barack Obama was doing before uh, uh, Trump came into office, because President Obama actually gave a speech at one point, at which he predicted that we were going to be faced with this around this same time that we're being faced with it, and that we needed to prepare. And he put some things into to action, created a commission, which Trump, when he came into office, dismissed. So we weren't able to prepare for it adequately because of that. I'd like to get a question yeah. right from the list. Carolyn Moyer, you had a question about uh, asymptomatic people being carriers, would you care to state that? Carolyn Moyer? Okay. Um, Eric Kearney, you had a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Randall? Yes, go ahead. Um, I hear the term asymptomatic frequently, and, and I'm just not truly clear and I wanted to get some clarification and to, to determine whether or not I'm understanding it the way it's meant to be. And that is that th those individuals who are classified as asymptomatic, am I to understand that um, they, are, they can be carriers, but they are not showing any symptoms of the virus? Can someone Clarify that for me. That's exactly what it means, that they have no symptoms, but they are carrying the virus and probably spreading it and infectious to other people. And a lot of them would have tested positive, so they know that they are positive and asymptomatic, but others may not have been tested and could be carrying the virus asymptomatically. In fact, there's probably a large population of people out there who are carrying the virus without symptoms who are contagious. That's why you have to be suspicious of everybody you come in contact with and do your social distancing and wear your mask. How is it that they can't, they don't, they don't have any symptoms and they are curious? What causes that? That's because probably, you know, there are many variables, but their immune system is effectively keeping them from getting infected with the virus. Everybody doesn't get a cold. Everybody doesn't, that comes in contact with the virus does not get infection, symptomatic infection with symptoms. So you can come in contact with somebody, get test positive and never have any symptoms. Hmm. Totally asymptomatic, but still have the virus and still have the capability of spreading it. And that's what the little kids do. The little kids are pretty much asymptomatic, but they're like powerful spreaders. Mm -hmm. okay. I have one other question though, uh, Randall, concerning the vaccine trials and all of that. And I just want to put things in perspective and I know it's a risk benefit analysis, but you know, it took about 15 years to develop the H1N1 vaccine, which is an RNA vaccine, which is only even now 50% effective. They've been working on SARS, which started in 2003 for more than 15 years and was unsuccessful in developing that vaccine. This virus is a SARS COVID-2 it's the SARS-2 virus, which is similar to the SARS virus that occurred back in 2003. So I, I'm just very skeptical of any vaccine that comes out within the next one year, two years, three months, whatever. I would be highly suspicious of it. And we were told as clinical scholars that when you have new products coming out, this, this is even with pharmaceuticals, 
Yeah, don't use them during the first two years because the clinical trials are run during the first two years. That's when you really find out what the real side effects are of a particular drug or medication. So just kind of keep that in mind uh, as we go forward with the vaccination thing. Now, somebody asked the question about clinical trials, which I think is very important. I think it was Dr. Thomas. He wanted to know whether we are being adequately represented in the clinical trials. And we don't have the answer to that. I think it's an excellent question. And actually I have been working with a group with a company called Cytodyne to try to see if we could educate our providers on the emergency use and compassionate use of drugs and medication in this illness, because a lot of our providers don't have access and probably don't know how to access these drugs. And the second thing is to educate our community to know when to request if they have a relative in the hospital, how to be an advocate for getting those experimental treatments that may help their loved one get over this infection. So there's a need and I wanna commend Richard for writing his grant on trying to get money to do this, but I have some concerns about how we're going to get the information out and that you can't really do the crowds and gatherings now like it before. So it's a real challenge now trying to get to the community, get the information to the community. And I'd like to know whether he has some uh, suggestions on how he plans to do that. Dr. Sherrod, just before he does that, may I ask you this? Um, the, some of those trials are being run by the NIH. The right. NIH requires, anyone who's on this Zoom has done it, inclusion of women and minorities, it's required. Why are we not seeing demographics on the clinical trials being run by the NIH? Because they're race. Let me go. Well, actually, we are with some of them. We are with some of them. For instance, the remdesivir trial uh, has recruited very heavily among the black population, and it. Uh, for the initial information I've got is that almost half of the subjects were African Americans or people of color. So uh, there is some evidence, but not enough, I don't think yet. Richard, where did you- this aggregation uh, this I haven't heard that kind of information announced even on, on TV. I'm sorry? I, I have not heard that kind of information. So thank you for sharing that because that's a major concern. We never hear how many of black course. people were in these clinical trials that got better or was given the medication. That's a major concern of ours. Well, it's, it's a historic, there's a historical reason for that, which I can't give you great details about it. Yeah, I know the details of that. Yeah. Uh, when this uh, first broached uh, the, uh, the NIH requirement uh, for uh, certain percentages of uh, minorities and women to be included in clinical trials, uh, that was hailed with a great deal of enthusiasm, but actually the way it went down uh, where uh, we didn't get much uh, out of that. Uh, the reason is because the pharmaceutical companies, which do the majority of these clinical trials, uh, uh, were given uh, kind of a, a backdoor uh, a way to get around it. And the reason they want to get around it is because of the fact that they know that minorities have the worst health statistics are likely to have the worst outcomes in right. the studies that are done. And they don't want their studies being muddied uh, by having bad information. So they tend to eliminate or downplay the numbers of minorities and women in these studies. So that's the rationale that they use. I just want to so say one other thing in regards to the uh, what was mentioned about the vaccines and uh, reiterate the fact that we are in a situation now, uh, a crisis situation where you cannot do RCTs. You can't take the time to do RCTs properly unless you're willing to wait that year and a half or two for, for vaccine results to come about. So this is the battlefield and on the battlefield, you change the rules of England to some extent uh, so that people are using observational studies methods, giving uh, healthy volunteers medication 
uh, and trying to see what will happen rather than using uh, people who actually have the disease versus a, a cohort which does not and uh, and doing a randomized clinical trial in that regard, which is a proper way to do it. And so we have to realize that we're in a different situation now. And that's the reason that uh, things like this are advancing. Last thing is, Jesse, you mentioned that we don't know what's going to happen uh, with uh, some of these vaccines and, and so forth. And you're absolutely right about that. Uh, and whether something like uh, the COVID-2003 uh, uh, virus uh, would uh, be, uh, have been uh, able to be uh, eliminated by the use of vaccines that are be being developed now. The uh, Oxford study is the study of a, a virus which uh, is being uh, made to replicate itself so that it can be used in any type of future virus mutation. And that's extremely important because no other study uh, is doing that. Uh, the, all of the studies, uh, which include vaccine development, are for development of vaccines specific. Uh, and not only uh, will the Oxford virus uh, or vaccine uh, uh, help to uh, eliminate COVID-19, but it has a mechanism due to this uh, retroviral uh, change that has been uh, engineered uh, it's a, a, which allows it to be reprogrammed for any future development of or mutation of virus or any other. So right. that's that's the reason that there's so much enthusiasm about that right. particular vaccine. And that is very forward thinking, I think, uh, too. They have used before the adenovirus. It's what you described is they're using the adenovirus as a carrier for uh, the vaccine. Right. There are a number of people who have joined late. I want to make sure that we get our panel introduced, and then I want to make sure we have interaction with our uh, listeners and so we don't just get into a physician's only discussion. But I'd like each of our speakers to take a minute and just reintroduce themselves in their position so people will know who we're talking to. Starting with Dr. Devon, please just briefly introduce yourself and what you do. I'm Dr. Gerald Devon. I'm a cardiologist in private practice in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. All right, Dr. Jesse Sherrod. Oh, Dr. Jesse Sherrod, Pediatrics and Infectious Diseases, Hospital Epidemiology um, and Health Policy and Management. I'm a retired uh, pediatrician and I'm the founder of the Association of Black Women Physicians. Dr. Randy Hawkins. Dr. Randy Hawkins, a pulmonologist in uh, Los Angeles, member of the Medical Board of California and one of the FDA advisory committees. Uh, Dr. Keith Norris. Keith Norris, Los Angeles. I'm a nephrologist and health services researcher. And most of my work is in uh, health disparities and in increasing diversity in the biomedical workforce. Dr. Richard Williams. I'm Dr. Richard Allen Williams. I want to emphasize that middle name, very <laughs> religiously, et cetera. And um, I am a uh, clinical professor of medicine at UCLA School of Medicine in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm also better known as a friend of Dr. Gerald Devon uh, in Philadelphia, and uh, who's president of a group that I founded called the Association of Black Cardiologists a number of years ago. And uh, I uh, am also the author of this book that I touted to you called Blacks in Medicine, which everybody to look at, especially in regards to what we're looking, we're seeing with the COVID-19 situation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Stephen Thomas, would you introduce yourself? Uh, this is Dr. Stephen Thomas. I'm a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the University of Maryland School of Public Health in College Park and director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity. Okay, and I'm Dr. Randall Max. I'm a nephrologist, uh, semi-retired or unretired in Inglewood. There's a question from uh, Paul and Michelle uh, Simmons. You there, Paul and Michelle? 
We're here. Which question? I've been I've been throwing some things in the chat, but I didn't have a specific question. I don't think. Uh, Megan William had. You got to go Maxine. Go ahead, Megan. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, and thank you for having me and learning a lot. Um, I, I, I'd like to just ask a, a couple of questions. I think Dr. Sherrard mentioned about the children. Um, just off the cusp, I have twin grandsons and they had this, this rash and no one knew what it was probably about a couple of months back. No one knew what it was. They, they it wasn't the, the the nose and the the foot and the mouth disease or whatever it was the name of it, but they had that. Um, they had the fever and everything. Um, so you know, I'm pretty sure we've had that. Um, and that's just you know one question. I don't know. Like we didn't do anything other than just treat them at home. Um, the other thing is here in St. Petersburg, uh, Florida. Um, my father, two of his Boulay brothers have passed. Um, and it was from COVID-19. Uh, one of them had, um, you know, a lot of health issues, uh, diabetes, um, high blood pressure. The other one was actually a physician in the Bahamas and was in good health. Um, a lot of things that though we're hearing here um, in our area, we are completely opened up. I mean, the restaurants are, they're sitting close together, they're eating, they're laughing, you know, it's no one's really staying at home at all. And a question for me is, no, you know, I, I know that the people in our community don't believe uh, that, you know, hey, it's not COVID-19. It's just, you know, something that the government, that's what they're doing. You know, they don't want to wear masks. I mean, it, honestly, it's incredible. Um, but we are doing a lot, like I said on our last call, a lot of preventative things. Um, you know, I have, if I open my cabinet, I have like 12 supplements and vitamins and things that we do religiously and on the preventative measures. Um, I'm concerned when it comes to vaccines, you know, because I'm taking it back before a little bit before my time with the T Tuskegee Airmen and, you know, is this real, you know, are they, you know, out to kill us, you know, but, um, so I'm concerned with that, but, um, that's, that's where I am. Okay. Where are I'd, you like from? To, I'd like to ask a question. This is Thurston Bilal. I had technical problems getting on the call and I had to call Dr. Norvell and he sent me a link. So my name may not be showing up. It may show up under Dr. Norvell, but I wanted to ask the group of doctors, have anybody considered the effect of electromagnetics or 5G to some of the symptoms that we're seeing? I've been dealing with, I'm a herbalist and I've been dealing with patients all over America and a couple countries and uh, one of the protocols that I try to establish is first off cleansing and nutrition, work on cleansing the colon and liver kit. We can't hear you. Did you cut off? That That's seems to be cut off. We want an answer. May have any interim. Can we address Megan Williams' question? Doctor, um, who's going to address Dr. Um, rather Megan Williams' question? magnetics from the 5g in hospitals and in other areas are are uh are increasing the covid 19 coronavirus and i'd like for you guys to uh to speak on that and see if there's any research being done or, or if that's even being considered because it's never mentioned in any of the chats unless i bring it up so i'll i'll, I'll mute and listen for your response Okay, I'm going to be taking the question from Megan uh, concerning her twins who had what sounds like the hand, foot, and mouth syndrome. They had rash on the hand, in the mouth, and on the bottom of the feet and all, right? Yeah, so that sounds like uh, inter that's an enterovirus infection, and uh, sounds like that's what that was. Are they okay now? No fever, or swollen glands, or anything like that in the neck? So not now, and Dr. Sherrod, they had it before, and it was it was it was more. We, we could you can actually tell that's what it was, but this time when they had it, it wasn't the same. It was just kind of on the the hands and some on the back, and it just didn't look the same. If that makes sense. Right. So did you try to get them tested to see if they had been exposed to? Uh... Well, at this time, you know, it wasn't. Uh, you know, it wasn't in our. In, you know, introduced to you us. Know, you suggest uh getting them tested even now and, and it will tell you uh you know whether that was uh 
an addition of co coronavirus in combination with the enterovirus infection. Okay. okay. Uh, and then concerning what, what else uh, you talked about, um, the trust factor, and that's a major factor for all of us uh, because of the system that we're in. Uh, I think in one of the purposes of this group is to try to form a panel of experts so that we can vet the information and hopefully gain trust from the community so that they feel like they have somebody who's looking after them that they can trust. That's one of the goals of this particular uh, committee. And then uh, I wanted to go to the other question about the EMFs, uh, electromagnetic frequency. I just got an article, part two on EMF, electromagnetic frequencies. And not only are they um, implicated in infections in general, but they are implicated in your health. Cell phones, um, Wi-Fi's, all of that stuff affects your body. You're just energy. And this article is pointing out not only at your, you're at increased risk if you're at high exposure to electromagnetic frequency, but they contribute to diabetes, hypertension, obesity. There are actually studies, and I can send this out to Dr. Maxey. I think I already sent you a copy. You can send it out to the whole group. The, the researcher is Dr. Elizabeth Plority. She's written the book on electromagnetic frequencies and uh, it affects and it's been implicated in a lot of illnesses like Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis and uh, a lot of the neurological illnesses. So you do have to be conscious of your exposure with your cell phone. You know, there was a big study about whether the cell phone at the ear resulted in brain tumors. And that information was, you know, they tried to suppress some of the information, but it is something that we need to be conscious of and we need to learn more about it. And I hope people will read the book EMF uh, uh, Radiation by Dr. Plurida and the newsletter that I sent out deals specifically with, so we're in double jeopardy. You got diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, which is a pre-existing condition, which is influenced by EMFs and viral infections are also influenced by high exposure to EMF. And we, that's my say on EMF. And I'd like to also say that uh, the hospitals the airports and a lot of the public areas, especially after the lockdown, have been equipped with this 5G EMF uh, technology. And in fact, I called AT&T to tell them that I didn't want it. And they basically told me that if I didn't want it, I might as well go with somebody else because that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. now, uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's a major factor that we need to always consider. So I established a little protocol where uh, I basically keep my phone and all my electronics on Wi-Fi mode while I'm at the house. At night, I'm unplugging my modem and I'm not having the phone with the 5G right next to my head. A lot of people sleep with it right next to them. So if there's a call in the night, they can get it. We need to establish protocols to protect ourselves, especially if you're experiencing some of these symptoms uh, try turning your phone either on Wi-Fi mode or turn it off. Or, or uh, if your children, uh, now that they're all out of school and doing things online, they're being exposed to a high level of, uh, of this electromagnetic frequency and we need to consider it because I've been, I think it's a major part of this whole scenario that's not being addressed, especially by the black community. Let me see if there's some people on here who can address some of this. Is Dr. Anthony Brown on? And I also see uh, Dr. Hildreth Walker. Dr. Anthony Brown, are you on? Dr. Hildreth Walker? Hi, Randall. We got Alan Betty here. We're calling, of course, uh, checking in from Cape Town, where we're, of course, in the middle of a major uh, effort here to control the virus. Uh, in Cape Town, we're one of the hot spots in South Africa, and we're the primary hot spot, I'll call it, that's identified tonight by the president on his national speech. But with that said, um, we're, 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 we have a, a, a level right now of approximately something like 15,000 uh, infected with uh, probably around 500 to 600 uh, dead. Uh, there, we're going into a third phase of the lockdown here, which is ex opening up the company, country now to uh, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, restaurants, uh, beaches, and so forth. 
under some limited, uh, of course, uh, operation. The beaches aren't open. Okay. But, but at any rate, we're opening up another level now to try to get some economic stimulus uh, generated here. The primary communities being affected, of course, are the uh, townships. And of course, we don't have uh, any breakdown of how that's a, the differential between the white population here in South Africa and the black population. That's not quite yet been uh, elaborated on, but it brings to my attention. I feel like listening to this, we, you know, we've been talking now for months about this. I feel I'm watching, I'm gonna say something everybody I think will get it. We're watching the OJ case. You don't know who did it. You don't know what it's all about. It, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, but one thing we do know, it's about being black and being white. And this is what brought our people together in response to it. We made it a black and white thing. If we're gonna deal with this, we've got to make it racial. We got to play the, the race card. There's no doubt about it. I've heard us say over and over, how are we gonna get our people to respond? They respond when they think they got something because they're black. That's where we make it. And we've got to blame it on someone else so that we can feel attacked. I'll use the OJ case as the model. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, I'd like to. I'd like to ask you. Uh, I know that 5G has been implemented uh, in South Africa. Uh, yes. Dr. Blount, can we have a little bit of order? Let me start a yes, quick sir. Thank you very much. People on the on the panel who would like to speak to the 5G. Uh, I was looking for Anthony Brown or Jerry Charlton to answer Dr. Bilal's uh, concerns. Dr. Hawkins, Dr. Norris, Dr. Williams. Any knowledge of that, but I, I would like to emphasize that this is not a hoax and I doubt that 5G explains everything regarding coronavirus that jumped from a bat to the humans. I would like to ask Ms. Whitney what city she's in because she talked about folks that are not paying attention to it. She Maybe. said uh, it was a St. Petersburg. This is Martin Pratt. Okay. Uh, Randall, this is uh, Randall, this is Admiral Johnson. I can't make my chat thing work. So when you get a chance, I have a question for Dr. Williams or a vaccine question or anyone who wants to answer. And, and actually, I want you and Admiral Brewer maybe to speak to some of this electronic question that Dr. Bilal was answering since you're both military people and have some exposure to that. But uh, go ahead and ask, ask your question, Dr. Admiral. Ad uh, I'm, I'm on a weekly uh, conference with uh, my college classmates. This would have been our 55th uh, reunion this weekend. Um, and uh, it's a mixture of folks who doctors, lawyers, economists, scientists. Um, one of my classmates raised the issue or informed us about some, uh, what he called helper T cell research. Uh, in understanding that, you know, all the immuno, immuno research is pretty complicated, but there's the whole antibody antigen part of the research. He says he's been privy to some, some emerging uh, research that's showing that the helper T cells, which are very important in uh, the immuno response, seem to be resistant to COVID-19 or at least COVID-19 doesn't seem to be attacking it like it is some other parts of the immune complex. Unlike HIV, for example, which was very virulent against helper T cells. And it's, it's very early research and complicated, but it's wondering if this can begin to account for why some folks who are asymptomatic or have minimal symptoms uh, can have the virus, can be contagious, but don't personally seem to be in trouble from it. I don't know if uh, Dr. Williams or anybody has seen any similar research. Anybody on the panel, Dr. Williams, Dr. Sherrod, Norris, anybody? I have not. Jesse, that sounds like your wheelhouse, isn't it? Well, I, I, I haven't, uh, I'm not familiar. Let me just clarify what he said though. You're saying that the T hepa cell has some resistance to coronavirus? Is that what you're saying? Or well, the example he uses is that when we had the HIV situation, one mm -hmm. of the reasons why it was so virulent was the it specifically attacked helper T cells, that population within the immune system. Mm 
Right. The coronavirus does not appear to be attacking the helper T cells the way it is some other parts of the immune system. Gotcha. I see what you're saying. So and there and and so and and given the helper T cells overall role in immunocompetence, is this perhaps and this is very early research because it's cellular. It's proceeding more slowly than some of the antigen antibody research whether or not this can begin to open the puzzle as to why there are so many people who are asymptomatic but carriers or people who get the disease uh, who, who clearly have the virus but mm -hmm. don't seem to get uh, very sick from it right okay yeah I, I don't uh, I don't I don't know of any data on that but uh, it makes reasonable sense because it okay. is I'll talk to him again next early next Sunday when we have our weekly call. See if I can get some more information. Yeah, if you can email me some of the information, I'd be interested in looking at it too. Because okay. Eric, can I ask a question? Are you on, Eric? Eric Kearney. Then uh, Cynthia Edwards. In the meantime, had a question. Uh, what is uh, Cardiovascular disease, TBD. Uh, Arnie Joseph had an observation. Someone answered, someone answered that for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, Randall, uh, Randall, there's one. There's one. I'm sort of going through the questions down here. Yeah, uh, but let me ask you a question. Um, that there, there has been. It came out in the Sentinel on Thursday that the governor is planning to cut back the funds for Martin Luther King Community Hospital. And I think that is an emergency situation where everybody on this call, even if you're not in the state of California, need to write, need to hit the governor's office. And I sent the uh, article to you. I don't have the website, um, but it's, it would be California governor website. We need to bombard that office with the fact that they, he cannot and I know they have to cut back the budget, but that is not one place where the budget can be cut because we're already overrepresented with the excess mortality. And the hospital has already been cut down. It's too small for the area that is serving already when they cut the big hospital to the community hospital. So I, I just want to request that everybody try to get in contact with the governor's office of California and let them know that we are outraged that he's thinking about cutting back funds at Mm -hmm. Dr. Maxey, Jesse. Yeah. Identify yourself. Can I say something about that? Yes. Okay, Tori. Uh, this is to Martin. Martin, did you uh, submit articles to the NNPA? Tori, would you please uh, who you are so people would know where you're coming from? Wait, say that again. Identify yourself so people know your credentials. Oh, okay. Sorry, this is Tori in Los Angeles, Tori Bailey, and I'm a community activist as as well as an elected official uh, liaison to the city, uh, past professor in private secondary schools, and also uh, president of uh, Association Health Information, that we did a lot of research and uh, review of medical records. So a couple of things. Uh, but right now, it's addressing Jesse's statement right there to expedite. We've been calling the governor's office for other things out this week, and the, the messages have been full, and they haven't been in the office. But I was thinking about Martin, if he could take that article and put it with the NNPA, with the Press Association, spread the news around, let people call in as Drew and and. Do a, do some other things in addition to what Jesse said. You can try to get through, but it's been quite difficult in the past three weeks. We talk to Mark Ridley Thomas about. Yeah, uh, he's around. You, Did I hear Dr. Hawkins? Who who was speaking? This is Martin. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Martin. Okay. Uh, no, I didn't know about it. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. So I can definitely um, uh, add my voice to the, this is what, the article that Dr. Sherrod was talking about in the Sentinel. Uh, was this this Friday, Dr. It's, Sherrod? It's, yeah, it came out on Thursday. Thursday. I have a copy of the article and I can actually send it to you. Um, okay. I can text it to you. 
But we need to fight really hard to keep the money in the hospital because the hospital is well run now with Elaine Batchelor as the CEO. And she took time to write this article in the Sentinel that you know she's gonna have to cut back tremendously if they cut her funds. And that community is already overwhelmed. That would definitely be a tragedy. So we do. In fact, Dr. Thomas sent me some talking points and one of the things was, should we have an act up an act, uh, an act out thing uh, like the other people did when they- you know, When AIDS, yeah. Maybe we should consider that. Is that well, is I, still on the phone? I was gonna say um, before Dr. Thomas, uh, also will be helpful from a, from a press perspective and coverage perspective is if uh, some of the doctors that are in California, if you guys can sign a letter of support in that article and issue your own statement or slash, slash and refer to, uh, and I can help craft that or, or Ross, we can help craft that a letter of support in, in stating that article. So that actually gets yeah. it to another level. Yeah, and, I think that's and, a good idea. I'll be and, glad to do it. And Dr. Thomas, if he was, if he was, he's Dr. Thomas. You're logged in twice, so where you, we see you on camera. Where the other account is where we hear you. So I'm just letting you know you're logged in twice, and we can see you, but we can't hear you through your <laughs> camera. We're seeing you with no no picture or anything, and that's where we're hearing you. Correct. That's where you're hearing me. Uh, now just so I have okay. better sound. <laughs> so so uh, uh, listen. Um, whether we have our version of ACT UP think of Black Panther Party, um, what they did was from our playbook, <laughs> they used the methods out of the civil rights movement. They marched on the NIH, they did all those things. Yeah. We always think of our friends in those government agencies. So we don't wanna criticize. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we've been cut loose people. So we yeah. have to be creative and reimagine how do we do the same kind of thing and demand, start making demands on these agencies because that's where our tax dollars are. Right. And they're not serving us. We've got to get real creative here. So in response to what you said, Dr. Thomas, and what Hal and Betty Walker said, um, we've had a small group meeting. We call them the steering committee. And we created a name uh, called the Black Health Trust. And the idea of that name was to start providing vetted, credible information and uh, doing that under the banner of a 501c3. And uh, I do think that we don't want to just have a series of phone calls and just get information, but we have to have some type of community defense or even community offense about this. And uh, we've asked uh, two gentlemen that are both in the journalist area to help us put that type of message together. We've also talked to Mr. Arnie Joseph, who does major work with uh, some of the big medical companies. But uh, could very briefly, uh, uh, Martin and Ross, you just, uh, as quickly as you can, say some of the ideas of how we're going to uh, put an action plan into place. I know we can't talk about everything now, and I want to get back to more questions. But just in a couple of minutes, can you state what we've talked about and how we can get this word out? Uh, sure. Um, just FYI, we reached over, so far, we reached over uh, 500 people on the, the Facebook Live. Um, Ross, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Maxey. The direction that um, we want to um, push the Black Health Trust in, um, certainly with their guidance, is just as Dr. Maxey um, articulated, was to a, establish a team, a very broader team or a group of members, positions, those who um, have excelled and are renowned within their own specific areas of discipline uh, to offer credible information and to distribute that information as broadly as, as possible. Um, it, it does not necessarily mean that all members or all um, uh, persons who participate are going to be uh, completely aligned or agree, but at the very least, that information 
will be shared to empower our communities, to inform them um, as to uh, what some of the core considerations are of uh, Black medical professionals within the country and actually abroad. Over the next week um, to two weeks, uh, we will work to develop and fully define the brand of the Black Health Trust. And uh, that yield will produce a mission, vision, objectives, clear objectives as to um, how we will organize, how we will advance our message, as well as um, how we will drive forward the production of uh, this, this, this great gathering today. So over the next couple of weeks, um, uh, certainly Dr. Maxey will make everyone aware of our progress. Um, we will likely take the form as it appears of a nonprofit 501c3. Um, we will likely take on um, some structure of membership that is currently being defined as well. But as we progress, uh, Dr. Maxey, as well as core team members will ensure that everyone is kept apprised. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I see Steve Muldrow, are you still on? Yes, I am, Randall, thanks. Yeah, my question was uh, pretty germane. It was piggybacking on uh, what Megan started with. Our area here in the DC area is starting to open up and um, people are going to restaurants and shopping venues and beaches and things like this. What things can we do to protect ourselves as we go out and should we be going back and re-emerging into social activity and as doctors personally are you all doing it thank you well um, i think i can address a little bit of that i think you have to really uh, assess the situation in your locality and what's going on with the outbreak in the area and consider those things when you're uh, considering re-engaging into regular quote unquote activities. I think it's kind of early in general. And the reason I have problems is that we're not doing enough testing. We're not even doing the contact tracing. They're just you know, educating people on contact tracing. Those are the two cornerstones of public health. Those are the two measures that are the cornerstone of control of epidemic, testing and contact tracing. So if you don't know where the virus is, you don't know who's spreading it. So I would be very reluctant to be going into bars right now, going to church, even going to the beauty salon. And especially if you are an older person with pre-existing conditions like diabetes, hypertension, uh, obesity. Obesity, they've shown that, that uh, you know, fat is not conducive to a strong immune system and overweight. Dr. Hawkins, I would just ditto it's everything that Dr. Schroyd said. I don't need to repeat it all. I agree with 100%. It's too soon for all the reasons she stated. Dr. Devon. I would agree scientifically, if you want to avoid the infection, you should stay home. But I think there is a reality I mean, some people are in a situation economically, financially, that they are destitute and feel they have to go to work. Right. I, I don't know how you juggle those two things. It's a personal choice which, that you have to make. But certainly if you want to stay healthy, staying home is the, the way to go. But if you do have to go out, then I certainly wouldn't go to those extra things. I wouldn't go to a ball game. I wouldn't go to a bar. I wouldn't do those things. But do what you have to do and come home. Right. And you know, and you know, it's not just personal because if your if your job is considered uh, essential, right, yeah. and you don't go back because of whatever, you lose your unemployment benefits, and you're no longer eligible for some of these other programs. So, what meatpacker in the past thought, oh, I'm essential, or the low income wage earner in a nursing home, oh, I'm essential. Now they're essential. And they have to put themselves mm -hmm. in danger. We have to, we have to expose that. Mm -hmm. Can, can uh, I let's... chime in, Doc? Hold on. Let me go to Dr. Carolyn Haller, distinguished radiologist. Dr. Taller. Oh, I thought you said Alan. Yes, I'm over here boiling. <laughs> 
um, because I'm, I'm reading the comments and I have a few comments to make. Um, one thing is we need to deal with the discrepancies that we're hearing on the news and what we're talking about here. One thing I'd like to bring up is that they've recently said in the news that it is highly unlikely that you're going to get the COVID virus through contact, meaning by touching pa packages, by touching items, even though you know they know that the COVID virus can live for certain amounts of time on these objects. There have been no reported cases and they're now saying you don't have to worry about that. Now that's not 100%, um, but you know the primary spread is the respiratory droplets. So I think people don't have to panic anymore about washing off packages and stuff like that. Just wash your hands. That's one thing. Um, as far as the vaccine issue, I want everyone on this call to know that this is a fact. The CDC left out of a 2010 report that autism was increased by 350% in black males who got vaccinated on time up to 36 months. A whistleblower named William Thompson, you can Google it. Some of the information has been taken down in terms of the percentages. I started following this from the moment I saw him on TV disclosing that. And I started copying some of the articles and he said 350%. Now, if you even go to Snopes, which is a site where you can actually look up factual information and um, look at the things, the rumors that are running around on the internet and they're supposed to have fact checked it. Even if you go to Snopes about William Thompson, they will say, we can't find the information about the percentage that he gave. And he later kind of came back and said, well, I said it was mildly increased. Now that's because he was forced to, he still works for the CDC. So given that, given that, that the CDC is now outed as having intentionally left out detrimental information about vaccines. How can we trust the CDC? Also, there's a video going around about Bill Gates. It's, it's the Corbett Report. It's a three-part series. And it talks about the history of Bill Gates and how he became so entrenched in world global health and how he has funded the World Health Organization, the CDC, he's given money, millions of dollars to so many institutions. And now he's like the czar of vaccines. And he's the one who's saying, we're gonna make a vaccine. Everybody needs to be vaccinated. Um, and you, they have clips on this video series of him saying, when Donald Trump asked him, should we look into vaccine safety? He said, no, that would not be a good idea. He's also been shown, and I saw this myself, him saying that vaccines would be a good way for population control. Now, this is a man who is now leading the effort in creating a vaccine for this virus. It is also said that he has owned a patent to a, a coronavirus vaccine for six years prior. Pardon? No. So I want people to know this and you can look it up for yourself. We have to be very careful about the introduction of a vaccine at such a rapid pace. And notice the administration that this is occurring under. It's occurring under a president who is known to give favor to corporations. He is the party of corporations. The Republican party is the party of corporations. This gives an open field to corporations to get their products out there. They're not, have to, they're not going to have to undergo thorough testing, thorough vetting. And mind you, there's never been a vaccine trial, except I think in um, Denmark, where they have tested the unvaccinated against the vaccinated. They have only tested one form of vaccine against another because the presumption has been, oh, we found vaccines that work. Therefore, we can't, we can't test unvaccinated. We have to test everything against, you know, another vaccine. There was a, 
regarding clinical trials, there was a trial for Benlista, which is a, a drug that came out recently for lupus. They did not have very many black people in that trial. The reason why they said they couldn't get black people on the trial. Now, I don't think they knew how to do outreach to black people because there are enough people with severe lupus who probably would have gone into that trial. This was brought to their attention by a community group, lupus support group in Inglewood saying, why weren't there more black people on the trial? They said they couldn't get them. So in terms of trying to get the message out to black people, you have to use the venues that they're using. You have to use social media. You have to get some celebrities. You have to get some rappers who they will listen to or some, what do they call it? In influencers, you know, some YouTube influencers to, to reach them and at least give them resources, like direct them to the resources we're talking about creating. Another thing I'd like to say is Color of Change is doing a beautiful job. Everybody should go look at Color of Change and see what they're posting about COVID virus and, and Black people and how to protect yourself. So we need to combine forces and, you know, it's, it's going to take a village anyway, but, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can find those collaborators who we can work with to exchange information and try to get the medical information through some of these other sources that have access to a lot of Black people. So I know that's, that's you, know, you always have critical information. Uh, that's so good. Uh, Bishop Sandra Pate, you had your hand raised. Yes, hi. Hi, and thank you, um, everyone. We've learned so much. We're so grateful. Um, I just, it's a very broad question, but I was kind of interested in um, any doctors that want to chime in on what you're seeing with recovery. Um, you know, here in Louisiana, the uh, couple people that we've known had COVID, one passed away, and um, some seem to be struggling in the recovery process. Uh, if Dr. Bilal is still with us, I'd also like to know if there's some things that on the natural side that he suggests for those who are in the recovery phase. But, you know, we're hearing about in other places, young people who uh, have been impacted by COVID and, you know, their, their energy level is not the same. They're having trouble, um, you know, with respiratory issues. So I just wanted to hear something about what you doctors are seeing with those in recovery. Let's start with Dr. Hawkins. Thanks, I have a question. Uh, your recovery is slow. And part of the problem with recovery is that folks need uh, therapy. They need psychological support. And there's limitations in getting folks to those, those specialists. So if you're in, laid up in bed for three weeks, four weeks, and you're not using your muscles, and they're going to weak, and you're going to atrophy. So there are real issues regarding uh, recovery. It's an excellent question. And unfortunately, we have some limitations with uh, getting folks to those specialists. Uh, so hopefully what's happening is uh, as the doctors and uh, therapists open up their practices, uh, they're actually practicing the types of social distancing and PPEs that are needed. So they don't have, you know, the, the 20 or 30 people they used to have in there in the past, but they actually sort of uh, have folks come in in limited numbers and be respectful of the fact that not everybody may know that they have been exposed. Uh, we have to emphasize what Dr. Schreib said previously, there needs to be more testing and there needs to be contract tracing. Um, that's what saves us. That's what helps us know uh, where we are. Uh, uh, and we're working from a position of strength, not ignorant, ignorance about where we are in, in the community. So we need to increase our testing and get our contract uh, contract tasting above. I don't know if there are any uh, therapists on psychological or physical therapists that are on the call or not. Uh, any physical medicine folks on the call? Or? We have had some on, some emotional support people on earlier. But mm -hmm. I had one thing, if I may, Randall, um, I had an experience with my niece who was infected with uh, COVID-19 in a assisted living. She was a nurse in an assisted living place. She did not have to be hospitalized. 
they quarantined her for 14 days. And this was early on, like in March when she got infected. She has underlying asthma. She I mean, she recovered without having to be hospitalized, but she continued to have shortness of breath on exertion. She said, I, I, all I can do is rest. You know, I, if I get up to do anything, I get short of breath. And what I did for her, and I'm just gonna recommend this one, it's a supplement, but it was developed by a scientist at the University of Utah. It's called ASEA, A-S-E-A, -E like the C, A-S-E-A. -E I sent some ASEA to her. Within 24 hours, she noticed a change in the dyspnea on exertion. And by the end of the week, she was doing aerobics. Now that was a recovery, a leftover from an infection with COVID-19. Uh, so that's just one supplement. And I know uh, Dr. Bilal probably has other supplements, but people are having lingering, lingering of the shortness of breath, I think, after recovering. It takes a while. And I was actually thinking that she was going to go down here because I understand that the drop in the oxygenation is precipitous and that they can be talking to you and then all of a sudden the, the, the oxygen drops precipitously and they may need to go on a, a ventilator or oxygen therapy. Do you know if she had chest x-rays or any type of simple spirometry? Do we know what her lung function was like in any regard? Because well, she didn't I, talk I, a lot. I don't think she had, um, I don't, even I, chest yeah, X-ray. Yeah, I don't think she had. Um, that had made it. The primary care doctor would not see her back in his office. She had been to the emergency room, and uh, found out from the facility, was tested through the emergency room, and the primary care doctor would not ha uh, see her in the office when she, because I had told her to go back, and get a chest X-ray and all of that. So we don't have any of those uh, parameters. Because I was thinking that maybe she hadn't had an asthma attack in years, though. So this infection exacerbated the asthma, and she had the residual. She treated herself with azithromycin, she told me. And that's all the treatment she had. And then she was still short of breath, but the ASEA took care of that. Now, the ASEA works by redox signaling, and it actually improves the ability of the immune system to work. Uh, can can, can so, I be? So, we got about three minutes before this thing cuts off. I want to make sure. I want to give Dr. Blau the last word to answer uh, Bishop uh, uh, Pate on that, and then we're going to have to close the call. Yes, uh, Bishop. Um, thank but, you. Thank well, you, Doctor. Uh, the uh, What I've been using as a protocol is. Uh, mainly a, a, what I call a lymphatic cleanse. And what it is is some formulas that I develop as a cell cleanser, a lymphatic cleanser, and then some nutrition from a combination of iris moss, bladder whack, no pile, dandelion, burdock, yellow dock, powdiaco, elderberry, and soft sarsaparilla. And uh, along with that, people that are having pulmonary issues, I, I assembled a lung tea, and that's primarily mullein, guaco, um, uh, Yerba Santa some, and some other herbs that I get from South America that basically help as expectorants and they work quite well with people with asthma and difficulty of breathing and any type of lung issue. Uh, sinusitis, it works as well. So I've had great success uh, with that protocol, but the people have to clean up their diet. They have to get rid of that dairy. And a lot, what people don't understand is a lot of the meat is compromised because uh, how do they know when viruses come where the animals get it and then they give the animals antibiotics. So when you eat the animal with antibiotics, you're, you're getting it too. So it, it uh, hold on, I'm getting a call. So uh, it will, um, it will, uh, you have to clean up your diet. So what I learned from Dr. Sebi is there's only one disease that's never been two, he used to say, is inflammation or mucus. So most of these compromised uh, uh, issues uh, dealing with different diseases, inflammation is at the core. So clean up your diet, clean up the dairy, the meat, the starch, and the sugar. And sometimes uh, if somebody is, is, is going through a distress, stop eating for 24 hours and just drink water. I found that lemongrass tea and ginger is excellent for building the immune system and helping in these situations. Thank you, Dr. Valau. And uh, we're working with him to help develop some more products and make them available. 
very quickly before we introduce the other Bishop Pate, uh, is Adam Brewer on real quick on the natural healing stuff you're using with your, with your mom? Well, um, in my protocol, you know, I'm taking care of my uh, centenarian mother, 100 years old. Uh, and so I, we have a, some specific protocols that we go through, uh, match a green tea with uh, lemon juice, um, elderberry, I have a special elderberry syrup, which also includes vitamin D and Kamu Kamu, which is the highest vitamin C uh, uh, fruit, uh, as well as hibiscus tea, which is uh, matcha and hibiscus tea are the two highest antioxidant teas. So my, and then of course, match, uh, manuka honey and black seed oil. So that's sort of our protocol. I don't leave the house. I learned this from you, Dr. Maxi. I gargle <laughs> when I come back in. <laughs> and I also uh, make sure that I don't leave the house unless I basically take that protocol. because That's my self-defense. And we haven't had a cold or the flu in 10 years. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've got to go. I want to introduce for a brief uh, prayer of blessing, uh, Bishop White Pate. That we Brother Maxi, uh, Dr. Maxi, I just want to say one, one thing real quick. Everybody, please wash your shoes when you come in the house. So if you're going to be going out and everybody's going back to reopening, it's been found for the tracking the virus back in. We have a protocol at home that when we come back in the house, we wipe off our bottom of our shoes with a mixture of alcohol and whatever you got, scotch, you know, whatever you physically have that can be a cleanser for the bottom of your shoes. And then we are adamant about not leaving our shoes, uh, wearing them in the bathroom or in the bedroom. Do you use alcohol on Stacey Adams? Uh, yes, sir, on the bottom of my shoe. I'd rather have use the alcohol on Stacey Adams than be uh, get corona. Yes, thank everyone on this line today. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the Black Health Trust. Lord, use it, Lord God, as the rock that would tear down the false lies in our community. Bless every one of these men and women, their families. We pray a special prayer for our dear mother, 100 years old. And Lord, we thank you for financial people to come to help those that get cut off in the near future by the government. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thanks, Dr. Maxie. Thanks, doctors. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. God bless you all. Dr. Dr. Maxie. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Jesse. Eat to live, don't live to eat. Dr. Hey. Maxie. And in thanking all the doctors that's been on and so much good information. Um, these meetings should be certified by the NMA for CMEs. Just the <laughs> Going back into my old job. <laughs> That's an excellent idea. We we should have them certified. Yeah. Can we get that badge, Dr. Maxi? Stamp it. Especially if there's no anime meeting this summer. Look at that. You got a, a few past presidents of anime been on the line. Cool. <laughs> and I feel like we've had what, over 300 years of expertise on this call, right? Exactly. <laughs> Probably closer to 500. I'd like to make an I didn't want to say that, Ross, but you do it. Uh, so we, I'd like to make a quick announcement. Uh, the Black Health Trust is looking for a an experienced virtual assistant to work with the project. If anyone knows of anyone, please, uh, we're looking for recommendations so that we can have someone on board as possible. You can send your information directly to Dr. Maxi or to me. Um, at 954-612-0627. That's Judy Maxey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Judy. Also, everyone Dr. Maxey, know we've been listening to by in Madagascar. They send their love from South Africa and Madagascar and did on <laughs> through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Dr. Tyler. I just want to remind everybody that July 7th, 2020 is Blackout Day where yes. black people and people of color should not buy anything, spread the word. We can let our economic power be shown. Spread it. Okay. Amen. Amen. Delisa. I want to thank, thank Dr. Dan, Dr. Maxi. I'd like to thank the journalists, uh, Mr. Pratt and uh, Johnson for uh, 
expanding our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Stop. Stop video. That's the first thing you hear. <laughs> yeah. Brenda. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> okay, I guess we're off, huh? It's yes, still up for Thought it was going to cut off at Hi, Hi, Brenda. Hi, John. Hi, Hi. Hi. Hi Brenda. Hi, <laughs> Shelly. <laughs> Hi, Jesse. Okay. Brenda. Yeah, you guys need some C some CME credits for this. It's been a whole 